hello and welcome to the second recording in my lymphoma series today we're going to talk about the first symptoms I experienced uh, when I had my lymphoma and these are visual disturbances so on January 25th 2020 I was taking a walk with my wife and we were walking on the street just in front of our house and I started seeing flashes in my field of vision and I had seen flashes a little bit before but I didn't think anything of it but that day they were bothering me enough that I decided to uh, go to the ER um, so my wife drove me there and I got to the ER and they diagnosed me uh, with um, migraines with aura and without pain and that had happened before I was I was in a Dodaro hospital before and they did the same thing they I had at that time I saw things I I don't know what it is I saw but it was a long time ago and that's how they diagnosed me they said well you have migraines without pain but with auras um, and I mentioned that to the hospital here and they did the same thing they said well it must be migraines uh, with auras but without pain because I didn't have any pain the only thing I had was uh, I was seeing shimmering in my field of vision and I can show you what I'm talking about um, this is a simulation not a great simulation but it's a simulation on the list of what I was uh, what I was seeing um, what I was seeing was shinier and it was not as, no, this is an ellipse, it was not as nice as that, but uh, this is a fairly good representation of what happened one day. I came, I was coming back to the house um, on my UTV on, on in the driveway and I was arriving towards the garage that you can see in the back there in the car, behind the car. And... Um, there was this big blob that just showed up in the middle of my field of vision and I was thinking at that time because I didn't know what was going on um, that was in spring 2020 I was thinking well this could be this could very well be the last day I drive uh, because uh, I had no control over those those shimmering blobs uh, and I did also see another form of shimmering that I saw was more like a static on an old uh, CRT TV, uh, an old analog TV, as if you see static in the TV. It was static that was more dispersed, so I could see behind the static, but it, it, it looked like static. So I went to the ER, they said you have migraines without, without pain. Uh, so what you're seeing is an aura. Uh, then I went to see an ophthalmologist and I had appointments with him on February 21st, March 10th, March 24th of 2020. Um, at some point after doing a lot of uh, studies of my eyes, he did a lot of imaging of my eyes and the imaging at his office took a long time. The technician was asking me to sit in a chair and she was taking her pictures and looked like this and looked like that and do this and do that. and. It was a lot of brouhaha. Um, I needed blood tests also to make sure that I didn't have Lyme disease or um, sexually transmitted diseases. I always tested for syphilis, I, as I recall, and I guess some people do lie to their doctors. They say, I've never had syphilis. And then the test shows that they do. <laughs> um, so I was tested for a whole bunch of things in my blood. They did an x-ray of my lungs to make sure that it was not, I think it was for sarcoidosis. Um, and eventually it diagnosed me with something called acute posterior multifocal placoid pigment epitheliopathy, um, which is a mouthful. And that's a very rare disease that people do get in the eye um, and will present similarly to what I had. Um, it did put me on low dose steroids and if you know anything about steroids um, is that steroids if you have a tumor 
steroids are going to calm the tumor. But really, in my case, what the steroids were doing, and they were helpful at first, but what the steroids were doing, they were masking the symptoms and they were not really treating the cause. The solution for lymphoma, for, for PCNS lymphoma, the solution is not steroids, it's chemo first, and then maybe a stem cell transplant. Um, then uh, in parallel with that, I said the first time I saw it was February 21st. We were not in the pandemic yet. Uh, and then I saw him in March. Um, and then we started getting into the pandemic mode where we, uh, we started putting on masks. When I was going to visit him, I was putting on a mask and the staff there was putting on masks. Um, so um, the first symptoms I had for my lymphoma started around the time of the start of the pandemic. And, and one of the questions I asked myself um, is, um, was the lymphoma caused by something related to the pandemic? And I have to say, because of the symptoms that started before the pandemic, I have to say that I don't think so. I mean, at worst, the pandemic might have been an accelerant, but it, it was not the cause of, of it and I and I thought about it and I thought about the sanitizers that we were using and I know some sanitizers that we bought they were eventually months after we bought them and we they were gone from our house that we didn't have them anymore I know that there were brands that we bought that were labeled uh, uh, as by the FBI as suspicious and then they gave batch numbers but which batch did I get I don't know it was months after the fact, so I, there was no way for me to go back and look at, at that and try to figure out whether it could have been a contributing factor. Uh, but the, the fact that the symptoms started before the pandemic make me think that it was not the cause. The pandemic could have played a role into how the, my illness developed, how fast it developed or how slowly, I have no idea but it is not the cause of my lymphoma. Um, another thing that the pandemic did, uh, it's like at the start of the pandemic, I was all, okay, I was all gung-ho, like, okay, uh, you know, I was uh, 47 when the pandemic started and my wife was 67. And she was in the age range that they were saying, be very careful because if the virus gets you, you may die. You're likely to die. It does, there was a good risk for her. So I figured, well, and I've mentioned that before, it's my role to protect her. So I'm going to be the one taking all the risks. If we need to, if one of us needs to go into the store to get something, I'm going to do it. Uh, if we need to do pickup, I'm going to do it. If we need to do this, that, if the, somebody comes in the house for a task, I'm going to be the person you know, talking to that person and being around him with the mask on. Um, but the lymphoma just blew that all out of the water. Um, because it's, I mean, at some point I just couldn't do it. It was impossible for me to take care of all those things. Uh, so my wife had to step up and so the pandemic you know at first I thought I was going to be the protector of my wife and it, it turned out that she was protecting me more than the other way around and knock on wood so far none of us has gotten uh, COVID in this household um, and so I, I told you the dates of February 21st March 10th, March 24, that I visited my ophthalmologist after that. The medicine seemed to work, but eventually it's it seemed to stop working, and I started planning to see him again. I didn't want just to go to the ophthalmologist for the heck of it because of we were in a pandemic, um, but at some point I decided I should see him again. And on June 5th, I had what I called an attack of lymphoma. Um, I'm not sure how it is classified by doctors. All my doctors know about it. All my, my oncologists know about it. They know what happened, that there was that event on June 5th. Um, but the event itself is going to be the subject of the next episode, so uh, I'm not going to talk about it uh, 
now I'm just going to continue talking about the visual problems that I had. Uh, so after the attack on June 5th, I continued. I started making contact again with my ophthalmologist. Um, I saw him on July 21st, August 4th, August 21st, September 8th, October 6th, and then after that, I stopped seeing him. Uh, what happened during that time? Uh, apparently, he showed the images that he took with uh, what well, his assistant took with their machines. They showed that to colleagues. They looked at my case. Then he changed his diagnosis. Initially, I was diagnosed with APMPEE, that's the acronym for what I said earlier. Uh, it changes diagnosis to MUDES, which is Multiple Evanescent White Dot Syndrome. And then it, his diagnosis changed again to Multifocal Choroiditis, which doesn't have a nice abbreviation. Um, he also diagnosed me with uh, Retinal Detachment, um, but Nobody treated me for a retinal detachment afterwards. And I've seen a lot of ophthalmologists elsewhere, at Johns, Johns Hopkins in particular. Um, I, there's no sign of retinal detachment. My father had retinal detachment, and it's an emergency. If you have, if it happens, and, you know, you need to be seen by a doctor, and then they can say, well, you know, if, if this or that happened, go to the emergency. Um, and we're going to do a surgery on you. But if this is what I had right now, I would not be able to see. Because it's been too long since the initial diagnosis to now that my, my retina would be detached and that I would be blind. Uh, nobody ever treated me for, for that part of it. Um, though Johns Hopkins did treat me for a retinal tear. So I don't know if that's what he saw and he misidentified it. It's it's a it's an unknown in my story, um, and so yeah, October sixth was the last time I saw him, and by that time I was pretty sure that this guy, who diagnosed me with very rare diseases and he kept changing his diagnosis, didn't know what he was doing, and he said that he showed my imaging to his colleagues, and some of them were at Johns Hopkins and stuff like that. I don't know if that's um, if he lied about that or what, but none of those people were were helpful. And that guy, I'm not. I've not seen him anymore. Seen him anymore. And he doesn't know I have. A, I probably doesn't know I have a lymphoma. I have cancer. Um, so eventually, uh, my vision after that, I, I, it, it progressed. You know, I, at first I had shimmering and I could see floaters in my field of vision and stuff like that. Uh, but eventually the shimmering disappeared. And what happened is that my vision became blurrier and blurrier to the point that I could not use my phone without turning on assistive technologies on it to be able to read the phone. Um, and at some point, it was so, the blurriness was so bad that I would turn on the assistive technologies, and the only that what I was doing was basically on the basis of touch memory, I I, I could see the icons like blurred icons, and I could recognize some of the tools that I was using, or or the image of my wife, or things like that. And that's how I was functioning with the phone. I could not I could not read text on it. Period. It was end of story. I could just not read it. Um, and also saw double. Towards the end, just before I got my diagnosis, I was seeing, uh, yeah, I was seeing double. And my eyes were getting crossed just by themselves. And and all of that, um, now, I mean, at the time, I didn't know. I didn't know what it was. I have eye symptoms. Besides everything else going on, I have eye symptoms. And the, the guy was not relating them to anything that I was experiencing somewhere else. I didn't know what was going on. And now I know that it is a lymphoma symptom. And one of the reasons I know that is because when I started the treatment for the lymphoma, the chemo, after the first round, there was a dramatic improvement in my symptoms and, in my, and including my visual symptoms. I could see better. And then progressively, as I had more chemo, I was able to go back to 
pretty much normal with my vision. Um, I can see fine now. I can read the computer. My assistive uh, stuff on the phone is still turned on, but uh, it's there just in case. <laughs> I'm a little bit reluctant to just throw away everything. It's, it's turned on just in case. I need I need it again. And they've improved also the interface, so I can leave it on right now. And because that's another thing, it's like if you need assistive support on your phone and you're alone and you need to turn it on and you don't see the f correctly what's on there you're going to have a hard time going down into the menus and figuring out what it is you need to turn on because you don't see <laughs> so i decided to leave it on in case you know i don't think there's going to be another problem but just in case it's still there sometimes i turn it on by mistake and then i turn it off um but it's still available and the only problem I still have with my eyes right now is that I've acquired a case of dry eye, mostly in my right eye. Uh, and this is going to be a, an ongoing refrain in my story that it's the right side of my body that really took a hit. So I have uh, dry eye mostly on the right side. Um, and I'm dealing with that with eye drops. And that's something that, you know, what caused it? Is it the lymphoma that kind of mangle my nerves on the right side is it um, just the chemo the lymphoma and the chemo the lymphoma punch me and the chemo <laughs> finished it I don't know um, uh, and I would mention also other symptoms I mo mostly my uh, during that timeline the symptoms were visual until I got the attack and then I had other symptoms but another symptoms that came on very early with the visual symptoms is uh, borderline weight loss. And I call it borderline because every time I was seeing a doctor, it didn't matter which doctor, I, my ophthalmologist asked about it, uh, the neurologists at the hospital asked about it when I had my attack, everybody was asking about it, they were asking about weight loss. And I did lose quite a bit of weight since the beginning of that year. but in my mind that weight loss was first of all i wanted to lose weight so it was not unexplained i, I was on a diet <laughs> uh but in in looking backwards now i think in retrospect i think that uh, that weight loss was also a sign that I was having a lymphoma and every time I was saying no 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 but it was borderline it was like close to what they want you know if they say if you lose more than so many kilograms or pounds per per week or per month and something like that and it was close but not quite but now I'm thinking it probably was a lymphoma because I regained weight and I've I'm way more than I weigh back then though right now I'm not really on a diet and I'm not exercising uh, tremendously so there's that also playing into it but um, I'm thinking probably the weight loss was another symptom um, so what did I learn from my visual symptoms and the treatment they they were uh, they tried for my visual symptoms First of all, uh, diagnoses that are given to you at the ER are usually complete and utter crap. And this is something that I've learned multiple times over. That I went to the ER and they say, well, you must have this and you must have that. And usually, unless it is very clear, you know, you go to the ER, you have a broken arm, they're going to say you have a broken arm, and then yes, <laughs> that's correct. Um, but if the doctors are there and they're pulling their hair out and they don't really know what you have, uh, what they tell you at the ER, usually, in my experience, if, if there's any confusion on their part, they're pulling something out of their rear, and throwing it at you and there's your diagnosis it's not worth much uh, because I did not have migraines I didn't have migraines without pain but with auras uh, the first time I wanted that it happened uh, you know a very long time ago I could be maybe maybe not but this time no 
it was a lymphoma and nobody knew um, another thing that I've learned in this experience the ophthalmologist that I was seeing diagnosed me with something very rare and then I was seeing him again and it was not improving and then he was starting to diagnose me with other rare diseases when a doctor does that and he goes from diagnosis to diagnosis to diagnosis to diagnosis the light bulb should turn on in your head and it didn't turn on for me it turned on afterwards it was too late it turned on too late really but it should turn on for you as for as soon as possible you know I understand that when we are having a health problem sometimes we're a little bit slow but let's let's be uh, aware that when a doctor goes from diagnosis to diagnosis like that and it doesn't seem to have any rhyme or reason um, that's your cue to seek a second opinion and um, the way my story develops I had the attack before I went to see the, the ophthalmologist back and he started changing his diagnosis uh, but you know what I could have done earlier than I did is just to stop seeing him because he was just changing his diagnosis all the time it's, it was nonsense um, so yeah those the visual problems were the first signs that I was having a lymphoma and nobody could latch onto that as a as a sign of, of lymphoma and I remind you lymphoma uh, primary sinus lymphoma is very rare it's 1500 people a year in the US that get it so doctors don't have a lot of experience with it usually and um, you're gonna see that it's gonna take a little longer for them to figure out what is going on and in the meantime I'm going to get me uh, misdiagnosis and um, a lot of uh, head scratching from the local hospital uh, which I do not trust at all right now anymore I do not trust the local doctors and I do not trust the local hospital I don't think uh, they're particularly good so the ophthalmologist for instance is an ophthalmologist that I've stopped seeing I fired him uh, and now all my ophthalmology is done at Johns Hopkins um, I've had a lot of work done in Baltimore but there is a they have a um, a satellite that is closer to my house 15 minutes away from here that is, and that's where I'm, I plan and I've had the, the blessing of uh, the um, ocular uh, oncologist that I saw at Johns Hopkins so they had a specialist at Johns Hopkins uh, an ocular oncologist looking at my eyes so that's somebody who's an ophthalmologist but is also an oncologist he knows about cancer and with his blessing I went to see him back and he said next time you can go to to the local place close to your house it's fine uh, what you have what what remains in your eyes is just you know a, a side effect of of the chemo so uh, yeah Johns Hopkins uh, has gotten uh, all my ophthalmologic uh, business and this is a refrain that is going to come back again and again and again through my story that the doctors here they're not worth much the doctors at Johns Hopkins they're great UMMC they're great Innova in, in Virginia they're also great but the local doctors no nope. uh, not for me anymore and I do have sometimes dispute with my wife's about with my wife about that because uh, she every time I mentioned Johns Hopkins and she drove for me a long time she drove for me she drove me there for every round of chemo because I had to be admitted she she drove for the stem cell transplant and she drove me there for uh, exams afterwards but every time I mentioned Johns Hopkins and that she should see Dr. Johns Hopkins she said well, I don't want to drive to Baltimore it's only going to be one hour which uh, can be true but it's not always true because the primary care doctors are close to our house and they're associated with Johns Hopkins and uh, 
there are some specialists in town here and again 15 minutes away from our house like the the ophthalmologists are, are near us and their Johns Hopkins plans to add more specialists in the area here uh, and I hope they, they do that quick and they have specialists that are not in Baltimore they're uh, closer uh, to us like half an hour uh, away from us for cardiology for instance my cardiologist is half an hour away from here I don't have to go to Baltimore um, so yeah the quality of care is important and um, you know if you have anything uh, Im that is impactful in your life that impacts your health get good doctors because there are shitty doctors out there and I have to say unfortunately my ophthalmologist was a shitty doctor that that office took a ton of pictures of my eyes it took time it took 20 minutes in the chair easily I and mean, sometimes more to take all those pictures you go to Johns Hopkins they do an imaging of your eyes it takes two minutes it's completely different it takes two minutes and at Johns Hopkins the doctors are on the ball that they know what they're doing so you sit in the chair here 20 minutes or two minutes at Johns Hopkins to get better service um, I, I think there's no there's no contest it's John, Johns Hopkins uh, wins so um, yeah I've gone for 26 minutes now <laughs> uh, so yeah those were the visual disturbances that were the early symptoms of the lymphoma. Uh, so I'm going to end it here and uh, I thank you for listening and I'll see you in the next episode, I suppose. See you later.